thank you, Markus. And thank you, Cla thank you Claudia. So, um, yeah, I'm just giving more details now on, on top of what uh, Claudia already explained. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm coordinating area A, which is uh, synthesis um, in, uh, in the Fermat project. But I'm also uh, working at the Institute for Kristallzüchtung uh, in Berlin, where we have uh, lots of um, different uh, synthesis methods, actually. So which is actually quite helpful to bring the results that we develop here in our area A or, or within Fermat directly to an institute. So that's uh, harmonizing quite nicely, actually. <clears throat> OK, so yeah, so this is the typical situation that you find in, in the, in the, in the, yeah, in the Crystal Growth um, Institute, let's say. Yeah, so you have Excel files where data is inside. There you have file servers where people store their data, and of course you have lab notes. And I mean, looking on this, you're, it's already quite obvious that it's hard. If if you would go there and need to work with this data, you you have to have this person that created the data next to you to explain what was this person actually doing and how how can I reuse the data. So this is really, uh, let's say, the opposite of FAIR that we uh, just heard um, from Claudia. And But if you put a little effort in this in, in, in this data, so if a colleague of mine, uh, Tashun, he um, put a little effort into his data and uh, um, cleaned up, structured the data, and he was able to already to, to set up a, a machine learning model and then drive, like, or improve his process um, a lot. Like he could, like, for example, improve the growth rates from very low to um, yeah to yeah to good growth rates that it's um, much better to grow now um, um, gallium oxide material in very good quality. So just uh, what I want to show is so if you can already put some effort and you get lots of benefit um, um, of your data if you if you take some effort and structure it and yeah so this is of course very motivating to transfer this to your colleagues or to to anyone in the community and but there are also more um, aspects of um, why you might need uh, good data management. And one very important one is, of course, uh, funding. So everyone is maybe already afraid of the new uh, guidelines, what the DFG brought out, that you have to have researched any research data management plans, and maybe you don't have it. So that might be a problem for you. Or um, you have data like this, as we see, saw before, which is very, this, which is only understandable by a fraction of your institute, but it's hard to reuse, it's hard to or always effort to to um, to bring this to new employees. Um, yeah, another aspect is repro repro reproducibility. <laughs> so you maybe want to always grow this kind of crystal and not that one with lots of defects. And you might not know what is the parameters that I should have tracked and how do they relate to each other. So good data management might also have there. And at the end. Uh, the big goal behind everything, of course, is you want to apply machine learning, artificial, artificial intelligence tools, or maybe a less uh, sophisticated, sophisticated goal would be at least you want to apply some automatization to save some time and um, yeah, speed up the processes. And yeah, and another maybe good reason is that the future seems to be fair. So at least that's what it looks like now. So the concept of fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data is very promising and already um, yeah, showed some really nice results. So you might want to not miss that future. <clears throat> so um, yeah, let me now show. Yeah, I mean, this is where we come in with the Fermat project. I think I can speed this up a little bit since uh, Claudia just mentioned that. Um, so we are here now in the yellow part. We would, so our principal goal is to have produced reprod more reproducible growth of materials from various synthesis routes. And yeah, so this is our, our goals and challenges that we have. So we want to establish metadata standards and ontologies and tools. We want to harmonize our schemes with synthesis and experimental characterization. And at the end, we would like to have um, yeah, computer-aided developments of synthesis recipes and interweaving experiment and theory. Yeah, so these are the big goals. And we have different institutes or tasks um, in, in, in our project. So here you see the tasks. So the tasks are synthesis from the melt, from the gas phase, solid solution, um, and assembly. And these are um, related to different uh, partners, like the IKC, the Max Planck Institute for Chemische, uh, for chemische Physik, Fester Stoffe, 
Universität Leipzig, TU Berlin and Leibniz Institute for Interactive Materialien. So these are the partners, the internal partners, but we also have lots of external partners that are um, yeah, also collaborating with us and um, yeah, working on that topics with us. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, so now I want to explain so what we actually really do in the project. So um, and yeah, as I said, we one thing to get to fair data is to structure to, to structure your data. So what, what does it actually mean? So um, for that, I want, would like to explain you a little bit um, about the data modeling approaches that we follow. And uh, yeah, for that, let's have a look on the typical data workflow. So most probably you have some raw data from like some measurement or from a log file from an um, yeah from a reactor machine. You might have some uh, lab notes or even better electronic lab notes, so notes in electronic um, or digital form. And you also might have um, data analysis. And at the end, you want to bring this all together. So you want to have the data and the metadata of all of this, and you want to connect this in a standardized data model. And to do so, you need a, a data schema. So this term, I will talk about more about this now. And yeah, once we have um, done this, you can work on the implementation. And then it's good if you have a tool which can actually work with these kind of data, yeah? because this is not trivial. Yeah? So there's not so many out there, actually. And one of the tools we use here in the project is uh, the Nomad uh, yeah, Nomad platform, or also Nomad Oasis, which is like a, a, a kind of a Nomad which you can run locally. And this allows you then to, first of all, input the data, search, visualize, and also analyze your data. <clears throat> so I want to focus now on this uh, data schema part. Um, yeah, so what is a data schema actually? So this is very important so that you understand what that is if, at the end. So um, in the data schema, you kind of describe your data, like the data types, how is it structured, and these kind of things. And in contrast to a template, um, which is more like a form where you would then type in values or like you fill that out. And if we want to use an analogy, we would say that the schema is like the blueprint of a toolbox yeah, where, you, where everything is described, how, how large is it, and so on and so forth. And uh, the empty toolbox would then be the, the, the template, yeah, the thing where you would enter your data in. And only the, um, the data that is matching to the schema will actually fit to the toolbox. Yeah? So at the end, you can then fill those two data um, things in, in the toolbox. And um, what we can then do is we, uh, we will get an archive file, which has structured machine readable um, data in it, and it's easy to share. So that, that's our um, yeah, analogy of, of that process. And this is what it looks like um, if you do this uh, with um, Nomad, or um, to be more concrete, meta, Nomad meta info, which is like a way to write down a schema. So, this would be a schema file. What you we see here, we see definitions, we see sections, we do see um, yeah, an element, we do see um, yeah, quantities, types, so also units. So this is just describing in detail the incoming data. So let's have a look on what the data looks like. So this would be a data file. So we do have a composition, an element. So it's apparently something about uh, water here. Okay, and so. As you see, and you see here, like how these sections match to um, to the different um, definitions we have on the left side, and together we can uh, put this in Nomad, and this gets uh, record, uh, yeah, processed, and we end up with this entry, which is then in a uh, uniform archive format, which is um, like the same for all kind of data that we got processed and inside the system. <clears throat> And yeah, you might, this might maybe shock you if you're not used to this, like, oh, what is this? Is this text files? Is this a little bit hard? So <laughs> this is where we want to help also. Yeah, so we, we don't want you to leave alone with this. So this is the Fermat approach also. So the thing is, we have data scientists or data stewards, name it whatever you want. They know how to handle data. They know how to write data models. They know all the tools that we, uh, that, that we implement. And on the other side, we have the scientists that know how to grow that particular um, crystal or do a particular measurement. And so they have this knowledge, that domain knowledge. And so we want to meet and help them then to develop the solution for them with 
data tools, which usually you do not learn that. I mean, you, you study physics, you, you do a PhD, but you do not learn how to handle data profic proficiently, or maybe you do a course or do, do learn, learn something on your own, but it's never as proficient as we can um, provide it to you um, within Fairmont. <clears throat> okay, and this is our team actually from area A, so the A team, and yeah, it's us five, and we have kind of different interests or strengths, and um, yeah, we, we then work on, on, on your on your particular case, but on the, in, the, in the back end, uh, we kind of use, of course, your data yeah, and develop something larger out of it. So we, we kind of generalize it and feed our data models that at the end, not only you can benefit, but also uh, other people in the community or even other communities can um, benefit from it. And also we can push uh, forward our uh, software development. Okay, and uh, yeah, so this is the first step in, in the whole chain. First of all, we start with a data revisions, how we call it. So to, to get to, to a schema or application definition, this is just another term for the same thing. So to get from something messy to something uh, structured and ordered. And so we just consistently describe uh, your data at that moment, that's important, yeah? So name, uh, give unique names, uh, information about the type of data, a description of the data, the value or where the value is from. So maybe it's, uh, a manual input or from a data file, the unit, and also like some grouping or sections where it all belongs. And the good thing is you get maybe better aware of what kind of data that you have. And it's it's actually mostly uh, just a starting point because once you started to do this, you will recognize, oh, I never actually track this data or I never put this in relation to this and that. And so it's really Usually, if you once do this, you will continue and, and, and finish it to the end, or at least you, you want to get the full picture of your data, or you see the benefit of it. And yeah, so this is a little bit hard now to explain, but I just want to summarize here, actually, because at the end, we would like to have a, a standard or an ontology, yeah, so that um, the data um, is machine readable at the end, and you can, um, yeah, um, yeah, you can share it. You can much share much better if it's a standard. Yeah, everyone else in the world will understand what you have. And um, I just want to point out which steps we already went. And so one idea we had or we're following is that we need flexible schemas in synthesis. So um, we, um, because um, in, in synthesis, um, we, we usually um, yeah, have an array of, or uh, a list of steps and it's it's very individual from lab to lab and maybe but the particular things you can maybe standardize so the idea is that we then have a flexible schema which is containing base classes and base classes are like the the minimum kind of schema to describe something like for example if you look on a sample this might be um, yeah uh, be uh, compound by uh, or has components and these components have a substance, for example, yeah, or there's a user that has a name, affiliation, like these are the, the, the base classes and which we kind of put together. And this is the things um, then which we can then compose application definitions out of it. So maybe you are, maybe you have a synthesis experiment, maybe you have a measurement. And as you, if you look here in detail, you see the same base classes showing up here and there just in another order. But the definitions of the base classes is the same. So this is kind of standardized. Yeah. So you can kind of exchange these blocks from one example to the other. And another thing um, we can then add later on in, in the implementation is we can add special functionalities to these base classes. Yeah. So that things get searchable or you add kind of visualization features or um, other uh, things that might be important or useful in, in the particular case. Yeah. And then uh, next thing was that we wanted to kind of link multiple archive files. So we would, to, would like to um, yeah, um, make the schemas less complex, but put that in different files so that at the end you have kind of a, a thing which is linked or referenced to each other, which builds up from, um, from the complexity and it's not all in one file. Yeah. And other topics uh, we involved are, is for example, a workflow idea, so a description of an experiment as a list of tasks with inputs and outputs and this is like where we already get much more general and um, get ourselves towards um, an ontology yeah where we then at the end i mean this is too much to explain now just to show what's happening in the back so we really 
um, model then our data and the and the relations of uh, of the different um, sections within our uh, data model to to each other. Okay, uh, let me. Oh, it's time already. So uh, let me talk now about the implementation. So we're using Nomad Oasis because it supports our uh, developed data models. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're in the project and we have direct contact to the, to the developer to really form the, this product in, into the, to our needs. And the good thing is you can have this locally. So um, you, and you do, are not forced to publish your data to the central Nomad uh, service, but you can just upload it to your own servers and have it uh, within your institute. Yeah? So there you really have access uh, control over the access of your data. It's never just out there and anyone can access it. Yeah. The next good thing is it has an ELN feature, so you can capture the, your data digitally and you cannot only capture the data, but you can also structure your data directly when capturing. And I think this is important um, as an in, uh, difference to other ELNs, which maybe do not have that feature or maybe, or it's easy for you to create a, a digital data, but unstructured data. And then uh, we have processing of our data into a uniform archive format. I think this is also good because then you have all the data in the same format. So you, you can learn how to work with one type of data and not so different types of data as we at the moment have in many, situa uh, many institutes. There's file passing for um, automatic um, retrieval of information of, of any files. And um, yeah, and the implementation of base classes adds extra searchability to your data. I think we will see nice examples later from Pepe and from maybe also from Micha, um, where this, um, yeah, where you see the this extra functionality in, in action. Okay, and then just an example at the end. Um, so this is, for example, um, some floats on crystal growth where the um, uh, where the scientist had like this kind of yeah form which we, she would fill out by hand and it's sometimes hard to read and there's things above. And so you do not really know what's happening here. And there was also an Excel file. And what we did here is then this data revision where she would describe all these things, give the units and whatnot. And then we would derive a, a, a first structure in a YAML file, which is just a text file, where we would just describe all this in a structured way. And from this, we would then translate into this uh, Nomad Meta Info um, schema language where we would then describe all these things again in, after this um, yeah, syntax. And then um, we have an ELN entry if, uh, later on where we can then, instead of typing the data on, on digital, uh, can, we can then di directly type in the data. We can then drop some files, the things get parsed and um, you can also generate like some automatic plots. And you can then uh, later on also share those um, results within the Institute and uh, other people can work on it. Um, there's also um, a Jupyter hub included, which is a thing mainly the area B pushed. Maybe there are some more details about that later, I think, um, where you can then launch Jupyter notebooks and then uh, look at the data again and evaluate that data that you uh, inputted before. <clears throat> there's also the AI toolkit um, to where you can see examples of machine learning and maybe you can even apply some of them on your data. It really depends. Okay, and uh, one last thing, um, data governance uh, is an important um, aspect in, in the whole concept, uh, context of Fermat. And we really push this in area A because at the end, if you want to um, really use these new tools, you have to make your homework before and really organize yourself what what is your actually data strategy or vision that you have? Why is, what is your motivation? And what are the rules you might have to work with your data in this in the context of this um, yeah, research data management tools uh, out there? So there's a lot of things you should uh, think about. And we are also here to um, guide you in, on, on, in this aspect. OK, and yeah, that would be it. So if you like, you can get involved. You can write to me or look on our GitHub page where you can see examples of things we already implemented. Thank you. <clears throat>